Good morning and welcome to the Old Kirk, and a warm welcome to those listening on the dial of sermon service. Well, what a week it's been. I got my vaccination. There's been some very encouraging research on the efficacy of the vaccines, and more importantly, on how good they are at stopping transmission. And the government has produced its route map out of COVID. The light is no longer a mere flicker in the night. The dawn is just around the corner. But only if we are sensible and keep obeying the ever-changing rules in the coming weeks. Let's begin with, will you come and follow me? whom society had rejected, accepted those whom the world considered unacceptable. You have time for us just as we are. Lord, we praise you. We remember how you called Matthew the tax collector, how you dined with Zacchaeus, how you touched the lepers and how you showed mercy to the woman caught in adultery, time and again breaking the mould, offering us through his faithfulness, forgiveness and new life. You have time for us, just as we are. Lord, we praise you. We remember that you forgave rather than condemned, built up rather than pulled down, encouraged rather than criticised, drew near rather than kept your distance. You have time for us, just as we are. Lord, we praise you. Merciful God, we rejoice that you accept us today, not for any actions on our part, nor through anything we may one day do, but simply by your grace. We rejoice that you have valued us despite our many weaknesses and our repeated faults. It is your nature always to have mercy, your grace inexhaustible. Help us to express our worship through receiving the love you so freely offer and celebrating your gift of new life. You have time for us, just as we are. Lord, we praise you. 
And hear us now as we pray together in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Our reader this morning is Jason Pringle. Matthew 5, verse 1 to 12. The Sermon on the Mount. Seeing all the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. The Beatitudes. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Thank you, Jason. At the beginning of the last millennium, the philosopher and cleric Thomas Aquinas was being given a guided tour around the Vatican by the Pope. There are two reported exchanges between the pair. The first exchange was a question from Aquinas, asking the Pope how many people worked in the Vatican, and the Pope's reply being, about half of them. And then the Pope, having shown Aquinas the vast wealth of the Vatican, says, well, Thomas, no longer can we say silver and gold have we none. To which Aquinas replied, true, but neither can we say, rise up and walk. The question is, Has the Christian church, no matter the denomination, improved over the past thousand years? Or are there still only about half the members active at any one time? Are we still so concerned with money that we've forgotten how to share the good news of Jesus so that it can actually change lives? As we gradually claw our way out of the pandemic, the challenge before us is how do we rebuild the church? What model of church should we be working to create in the coming months? Do we want to go back to Aquinas' time when the church had power over life and death and frequently used it to suppress those who would question and challenge the accepted order? The churches were full and didn't have any money worries. But were the people really there because they wanted to be or was it out of a fear of reprisal? Is that the kind of church we want? Or maybe we want to return to the Victorian age, when people were proud to be Christians and built those massive cathedral-like structures to show how much they loved God. The bigger the building, the greater the love. But they also kept on stuffing children up chimneys and forcing men and women to work in appalling conditions in the factories and the mines. Is that the kind of church we want? Or maybe you're a fan of the mass rallies of the 50s and 60s and 70s, where thousands gathered in football stadiums and heard the likes of Billy Graham challenge them to give their lives to Christ. But when the stadium's empty, often there was no one there to guide and advise and to encourage those who had heard the message. And soon, like the seed sown amongst the thorns, The message of the good news of Jesus was strangled. Is that the kind of church we want? 
Or maybe you think that an online church is the answer. People tuning into the gospel when and where it suits, united across the ether. But where is the visible presence of the gospel? Where is the unity? Where is the corporate strength that is needed to challenge the evils of our day? Is that the kind of church you want? For me, the message of the Gospels is that Jesus didn't come to create a structure or worse, an institution. He didn't come to form a committee. He didn't come to establish a system of church government. Jesus came to change the hearts and minds of men and women. Because he knew that when people opened their lives to God, then they would work together. They would share together. They would grow together. If we want to create a new church for the post-COVID era, then we can do no better than to return to the model that Jesus followed. That what counts isn't the number of buildings or structures or systems, but how people show their love for God. The Sermon on the Mount is one of the most radical and challenging sermons, manifestos, agendas, call it what you like, ever recorded. Jesus was executed because of the revolutionary nature of his teaching. And even today, if it is taken seriously, it will challenge the standards of every government, every organisation, every man, woman and child in the world. The problem is, we have become so familiar with parts of the message that we have forgotten that taken as a whole, it is truly a blueprint of what Christians ought to be like and what every Christian ought to be working towards. The Sermon on the Mount is God's guide to living a fulfilled and godlike life. And Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount by talking about the kinds of characteristics that ought to be found in the Christian. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers. And then he goes on to talk about how those characteristics can be used to make the world a better place. Jesus knew that while discipleship begins on a personal level, it must grow and develop and change to an external level. Otherwise it becomes selfish and false. Jesus began the sermon with the Beatitudes. Words that we are all familiar with. But how many of us still read them? And immediately think that they are relevant to us. That they're talking about me. Do I see myself as a peacemaker? Am I persecuted for Christ's sake? Am I pure in heart? I don't think there are many who would claim to think in those terms. And yet these traits are all the characteristics that every Christian ought to be developing in their lives. They're what we're all supposed to be working at just as Jesus worked at them as well. Blessed are the poor in spirit. All of us ought to be trusting solely in God and not in our possessions or wealth or friends. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. All of us ought to be hungry to see peace and justice for all. Blessed are the peacemakers. All of us ought to be out there in the world working proactively for peace. And when we do these things, when we try to develop these characteristics, not all at once, we discover that inside we are producing the fruits of God's Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness and self-control. And when the fruit of God's Spirit begins to grow and flourish, then you will discover a person who is a powerful force for God. Someone, when you get two or three of them together, you will discover an even greater force for God. And when a whole church of these people come together, you will have a force that is capable of changing the world. The church we have to create has to be one which is filled with men and women who are trying to take the challenges of the Sermon on the Mount seriously. Men and women who are trying to make these characteristics not even second nature, but part of their very being. All the Christians that I have ever met who have had any kind of impact on the world around them have all had one thing in common. 
That being that when you are in their company, you have a sense of being in the presence of Christ himself. You can see the characteristics of Jesus in their lives. God is involved in every area of their life. Without it being obvious or over the top, it's not about false air or graces, it's not an act. It's quite simply the work of the Holy Spirit flowing through them. And it is a joy to be in their company. As you know, one of my heroes is Eric Little of Chariots of Fire fame. He said that even when he was running, it had to do with God. He said that when he ran well, he felt that somehow he was praising God because he was using a God-given talent. The style of running reflected that because he said that he threw his head back so that God could see him smile as he ran. How we need more people like that. People who are prepared to work at being a Christian, not for personal gain, but so that the world might be a better place. If we want a church that God can be proud of, then it has to begin with you and me, the individual, taking seriously the challenges of the Beatitudes. But it doesn't end there. Because in the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus then goes on to say that the Christians have to become the salt of the earth, the light of the world. In other words, the reason for letting God work in your life to change you in the way that Jesus is talking about in the Sermon on the Mount is so that you can make a difference in the world. When you look at the great Christians of history, the reason that they are remembered is because of how they have stood out, because of the things they have achieved in the world. Mother Teresa stood out by living in poverty with the people she wanted to help. What greater example of being poor in spirit could you want? William Wilberforce suffered the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune as he battled to abolish slavery. What better example is there of hungering and thirsting after righteousness? John Paul II played a huge role in the defeat of the threat of communism. What better example of peacemaking can you think of? Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount because he knew that the qualities he was talking about were needed in his day and they are still needed today. As Christians, we need to be putting those characteristics into practice. We need to show the world that we do indeed have something concrete to offer. That we can add spice to life. That it's not just mere words that we have to share. Three examples of what I mean. Lockdown has reminded us of just how important a hub the church still is. People have found themselves isolated and alone because they do not have a church to go to. Because church is where they meet other people. In a few weeks, it looks as if we are going to have an election. And personally, I would like to see the main policy of every party being a commitment to reform the social care structure in our society. That was all we heard about during the first lockdown. How we needed to value the carers and the vulnerable, and quite right too. But what have we heard over the past few months? Nothing but referenda and independence. If we want to rebuild a church fit for God, then we could do no better than to make social care the issue on which this election is fought. And the third example involves all the churches south of the river working closer together without worrying about readjustment or closure. If we can all be faithful to God's calling, if we can all try to live out the beatitudes in our lives, then no matter what happens, no matter how many buildings might close, it will be for the best because it will be part of God's plan and the people of Ayr will be blessed and surely that is what we all want. These are the kind of things that Christians ought to be involved in if they want to see the kingdom of God grow. If we want to build a new church post-pandemic, then we have to begin the building process in our own lives. When we have to start allowing God to work in our lives so that the qualities and characteristics that are to be found in the Beatitudes are also to be found in our lives. Then 
We have to leave the security of our buildings. And we have to go out into the world and get our hands dirty, doing the kinds of things Jesus did to help others. Our Christian future will not be secured by structures or buildings. It will be secured by returning to the teachings of Jesus and by allowing God to work through us. Amen. Alan Templeton is going to lead us in prayer. Our prayers of intercession. Eternal Father, we come before you today to give thanks for all the many blessings you have bestowed upon us this week and to ask for your help in getting us through another in these difficult times. We thank you for the skill and dedication of our scientists, doctors, nurses and care workers who are on the front line in the current pandemic and we express our gratitude to so many others in our society on whom we rely to help us overcome countless obstacles in our daily lives. Lord, every day we are confronted with data on infection rates, hospitalizations and deaths associated with coronavirus. And it's all too easy to feel overwhelmed sometimes with a feeling of hopelessness and despair. At times we appear to believe that things are improving and the end is in sight, then at other times we are plunged back into fear and despondency. Father God, be with each and every one of us in our despair. Be with those we love who we cannot see. Be with those who are facing their final days apart from friends and family and comfort us with the knowledge that you are there in the despair, the loneliness and the fear. We know that not one of your beloved children suffers or leaves this world alone. Please strengthen our beliefs in this time of crisis. Father God, we are aware that all too often we pray from fear or from necessity, at times of sickness or private loss. Our conscience sleeps unless we are afraid. We ask your forgiveness for past weaknesses and for your eternal motivation in making us more aware of your presence. Teach us, we pray, to approach you in the good times as well as the bad. And show us that no matter how bumpy the road, the path to your eternal glory is assured. Lord, be with all those sick at home or in hospital at this time. Stand at their sides and hold their hands in your hands. And for those who find the trial just too great, we ask you to bear them with gentleness on angels' wings to their everlasting rest. Just as storm clouds gather, remind us, we pray, that the sun does indeed shine on in our world. Give us the faith to await that new dawn with patience, courage and humility. Teach us, Father, to be good disciples here on earth. Teach us to help others, being aware that one day we may rely on their patience and goodwill. We pray for our leaders and their advisors as they try to guide our world through this difficult time. Give them the wisdom they require to balance the medical and economic needs of our country so that we may come through this dark period stronger, more compassionate and more appreciative of our friends and family. Finally, we pray for our church and for all those who are working in difficult, unfamiliar ways to continue the work of the church, secure in the knowledge that one day we can all be together again in this beautiful building. These prayers and the thoughts of us all we bring before you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Thank you, Alan. And now may grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you and all those whom you love now and evermore. Amen. God bless and keep safe. We close with Seek Ye First.